is one high note in the Persian loss against the Greeks at the Battle of Salamis, one saving grace, a woman named Artemisia, the sole female Navy captain in the Persian fleet. She faked out the Greeks by ramming one of her own losing ships, and she sailed away to escape in the confusion. Her survival skills so impressed Xerxes that he was thought to have said, my men are becoming women, and my women are becoming men. The Persian Wars launched Athens into its golden age, but left the colossal Persian Empire vulnerable. It would be left to a young prince, a worshiper of Persia's great kings, to deal the empire its last blow. Humiliated by Artemisia's daring escape, the Greeks offered a huge price for her capture, but Artemisia had safely sailed home. BC, the Greeks had defeated the Persian fleet at Thermopylae. The aura of invincibility that surrounded this empire was gone. But there were still days of power and glory ahead for the Persian Empire. Fifteen years later, in 465 BC, the Persian king Xerxes died. Xerxes left the empire to his son, Artaxerxes who was determined to take Persia back to its golden days. He began by turning his attention to a building project begun by his grandfather, Darius. Four decades after it was started, Persepolis, the magnificent capital city, was still under construction. Now Artaxerxes would oversee one of the last great engineering projects of the Persian Empire. Today we know it as the remarkable hall of a hundred columns. We know that the actual hall was some 200 by 200 feet, almost on the perfect square. And what's remarkable of the Persepolis columns is when you look up uh, the entire shaft, and these things raise, you know, hundreds of feet into, into the air, there is not one piece of displacement whatsoever. It's a perfect, perfect vertical. They're working with what we might consider to be primitive tools, just stone mallets and bronze chisels, that's all. The fluting on the columns of Persepolis is so precise, however, that these are clearly the work of master craftsmen. The columns are constructed in drums, seven or eight drums stacked on top of another. This is done by scaffolding the whole area around the column, and then with a crane, a wooden crane, literally moving each column drum in place. Any client king, any governor from a distance, or even anyone who would come in that hall would be so impressed by the vastness of the hall and by this forest of columns that stretched nearly as far as the eye could see. An amazing achievement. Across the empire, Persians were still producing some of the most extraordinary feats of engineering in the ancient world. In 353 BC, the wife of a local governor began work on a magnificent tomb for her dying husband. Her tribute to him would be a marvel of engineering and would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Mausoleum of Masulus. The marble monument would rise to 135 feet tall, enclosing a great courtyard. The roof was a pyramid with a staircase on each side a pathway to heaven. More than 2,500 years later, the tomb of U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant in New York City would be designed after the mausoleum of Masulus. By the fourth century BC, Persian engineering was still the finest in the world, but underneath the soaring columns and shining palaces, the empire's very foundations were crumbling and its enemies were soon at the gate. When Athens supports a rebellion in Egypt and Greeks occupy the capital city of Memphis, Artaxerxes leaves Persepolis and his building projects, and he launches a military campaign to kick the Greeks out of Memphis and bring Egypt back under Persian control once again. It'll be the last great victory of the Persian Empire, because in 424 BC, Artaxerxes dies, leaving a power vacuum and eight solid decades of rampant infighting and neglect.
And while the Persian Empire is embroiled in internal conflict and corruption, a young Macedonian prince is studying Herodotus and the accounts of the great Persian hero Cyrus the Great. And this Macedonian prince will set his eyes on conquering the world. His name is Alexander. In 336 BC, a distant relative of Artaxerxes rose to power. He took a regal name, Darius III. He will always be remembered as the king who lost an empire. Over the next four years, Alexander and Darius III met head to head in a series of fierce battles as Darius III's army was slowly pushed back to its own doorstep. In 330 BC, Alexander was at the gates of the empire's crown jewel, the capital city of Persepolis. Alexander adopted the Persian policy of respecting the defeated. None of his soldiers were allowed to pillage or plunder the lands they had conquered. But how do you tame so many soldiers after a victory over the most magnificent empire on planet E? Well, maybe his soldiers were restless or resentful, or maybe they just remembered the stories of how Athens had been burned by the Persians. In any case, at Persepolis, they let go. Huge celebrations took place after the victory, and during these celebrations, the treasury was pillaged. And then one of the saddest acts of arson in all of history took place. Persepolis was burned. Alexander uh, was not in the uh, business of destroying things. Persepolis probably was burned because it was a symbolic thing. And he also burned it uh, to make a symbolic gesture, not a destructive uh, gesture. There were, must have been wonderful draperies and things around, and no doubt fire could have begun accidentally just as much as purposefully, because if he really wanted to be an Achaemenid king, the last thing he should want to do was to destroy Persepolis. But there were no fire engines, and once the blaze had taken hold, it, it was a very terrible blaze, and it, it, it left its mark throughout the site. Darius III had escaped capture, but in the summer of 330 BC, he was murdered by a close ally. The last Achaemenid king was dead. Alexander gave Darius III a magnificent funeral and later even married his daughter. Alexander declared himself an Achaemenid Persian king and added the final chapter to the story of an empire that had spanned three continents and endured for over 2,700 years. Alexander, admirer of Persian kings, chased down the murderers of Darius and killed them himself. Alexander believed that only kings had the right to kill kings. But would have Alexander actually killed Darius? Probably not. Because Alexander didn't create an empire, he only conquered one. The empire already existed, created by Cyrus the Great. No, Alexander's genius was to co-opt and use Persia, an empire that stood long before Alexander was born and whose legacy of culture and sophistication and luxury would be around long after Alexander was dead. For the History Channel, I'm Peter Weller.